um, I'd just like to invite you to worship with us. Um, unfortunately, I'm sorry, I don't know why the two front screens aren't working. There are words on the back screen, but not the front screen. So I'm at, I'm at a loss this morning with trying to catch up with things with Pastor Joy not picking them up. So, all right, would you give us some worship? If you have a hymnal in front of you, this is hymn 135, in case you don't want to turn around. And, but words are up there. Blessed be the tie that binds.
county and the state, and so we're just uh, being cautious and careful. We're looking forward to the day that we can have our potluck dinners and get together again and fellowship and do our Sunday school and Bible studies. So keep looking forward to that because it is coming one day soon, I'm sure. <laughs> but I also want to remind you for your um, regular tithing and your offerings, there are the dishes in the back that as you exit, you can just drop them in there for your giving from here. If you're giving online, you can give it at tithe.ly, tithe tithely.com, and um, you can look up Waking Friends Church and give online through that venue as well. They also have an app that you can set up, so that's one way to give. If you're not with us here physically and you want to give uh, online, you can do that through Tithely. And then you can also just mail in your gift or your offering or your tithe to the church here at 3116, or sorry, 3102 West Palouse Street, Boise, Idaho, 83705. Mm -hmm. As we look ahead to our announcements, we still need some greeters. So we it's one Sunday a month, the third Sunday of the month. We'd like a couple of people to participate in greeting those that show up at the door and just welcoming them, making sure that they have masks and they know uh, the protocols that we're following right now in this time to make sure that everybody's uh, welcome and safe and, and doing well. So if you feel led, just uh, reach out to myself or to Give and Donna Sinclair, and the, we'll get you set up and, and coordinated. As we think about our prayer requests, um, Carol has been, had been very sick and she had her surgery. Carol, we're so glad you're with us this morning. Thank you for joining us. I'm glad the surgery went well. I believe she goes back Tuesday to get her stitches out. Is that correct? Oh, yep, yeah, okay. Good. So we'll be praying for that and for Carol's speedy recovery. <clears throat> uh, remember Greg's sister-in-law who has cancer of the brain? Uh, Gib, do we have an update? He's uh, awake and waving to folks through the window. Okay. So she's awake and waving to folks through the window. So excellent. Excellent. Okay. Good. And then we're going to keep praying for Mark Erickson to get into a new study for his lymphoma. And any update on that? Nothing yet? No, he's still pursuing that. Yeah. Still pursuing that, okay. okay. And then Sue's friend Walter and Val's manager at, uh, at her work um, have COVID, and so we've been praying for them. We ask that you continue praying. Um, I have been watching the numbers, and the numbers have gone down the last few weeks here in Boise, which is in, in Ada County, which is good. And it, it helps with all of us being diligent and wearing masks and doing what we can do to help stop the spread. So thank you for participating and for wearing your mask throughout our service, for just uh, making sure that we're taking care of each other and being present and careful for with each other. So we're grateful for that. Um, keep Donna's butt in, in your prayers as she is working as the groundskeeper at Barber Park, especially in the evenings as they close up the parks. And some people tend to not be so nice to us, I right? And I'm supposed to be traveling to Washington this week. Like to share prayer requests? Um, a lady, um, her name is Jackie Stackman. Um, she was a friend of my aunt's and she's kind of been taken into our family. Um, she passed away this week from um, a heart problem, so we need to keep her husband Wayne in our prayers. Okay. And her name again was Jackie. Jackie. And I'd just like to lift some friends of mine up in prayer as well. Um, Chris and Brett Nolte. Uh, my friend Chris recently just met her biological father. And they had a great reunion over the last few weeks up in Montana. And got to get to know family and friends and meet her grandmother on her biological dad's side. And it was a, it was a great, great gathering and event. Um, they were planning on having an event to celebrate Chris's birthday here in Idaho, and they were gonna come down and be a part of that. But they found out yesterday that her father passed away suddenly. Oh, wow. And so, so quickly given and so quickly taken away, I just, uh, I wept for them this morning because I just, my heart broke for them. Yeah. So if you could just uh, keep the Nolte's in your prayers as well. Let's pray. 
Father in heaven, we're just so grateful that uh, that you love us so much. Mm -hmm. and that you, uh, you know when our hearts hurt and when we're celebrating victories and struggling through defeats and, and all the things going on in each of our lives. And during this crazy time of this pandemic and trying to figure out how to do relationship and ministry and all the things that are going on around us, it's confusing and it gets hard. We have so many people that we want to pray for and so many people we want to lift up to you, but you know all their names and you know the situations with each of them. Father, we just ask for your hand and for your presence and the movement of your spirit upon each of these situations and each of these people that we've been sharing about this morning. We ask for wisdom and for guidance and strength to know how to love and to walk beside and to be your hands and feet, Father, to respond when you say to move and to act and to, to love, that we do that in a way that just brings you honor and glory. So, Father, we lift up all these folks to you, uh, whether they're physical needs, health needs, emotional needs, financial needs concerns, grief and loss, celebrations and praise. We just want to honor you, Father, and just thank you for meeting us right where we're at and for walking beside us. We just want to give you the honor and the glory and the praise this morning as we continue to worship. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Let's continue in worship. Please rise. Did you know we're God's people, whether you're here, whether you're at home watching on the TV? Just take a moment to enjoy that particular accolade. We are God's people.
our name. And then, you know, makes you think of basic things like just how much I love Jesus because he first loved me.
this week I've printed out some different versions, translations. And so I just want you to just listen. This is the New International Reader's Version. So this version is um, geared primarily for 12 and under, is this um, reader's version, version is 12 and under, which is my, one of my favorite versions. <laughs> Christ has set us free to enjoy our freedom. So remain strong in the faith. Don't let the chains of slavery hold you again. Here is what I, Paul, say to you. Don't let yourselves be circumcised. If you do, Christ won't be of any value to you. I say it again. Every man who lets himself be circumcised must obey the whole law. Some of you are trying to be made right with God by obeying the law. You have been separated from Christ. You have fallen away from God's grace. But we long to be made completely holy because of our faith in Christ. Through the Holy Spirit, we wait for this in hope. Circumcision and uncircumcision aren't worth anything to those who believe in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. The only thing that really counts is faith that shows itself through love. You were running a good race. Who has kept you from obeying the truth? The God who chooses you does not keep you from obeying the truth. You should know that just a little yeast works its way through the whole batch of dough. The Lord makes me certain that you will see the truth of this. The one who has gotten you all mixed up will have to pay the price. This will happen no matter who has done it. Brothers and sisters, I no longer preach that people must be circumcised. If I did, why am I still being opposed? If I preached that, then the cross wouldn't upset anyone. So then, what about troublemakers who try to get others to be circumcised? I wish they would go the whole way. I wish they would cut off everything that marks them as men. <laughs> That's the uh, young reader's version. <laughs> we'll have some others in a minute. Pretty extreme. Yes. The letter to the Galatian churches, it was to correct the false teaching of Judaeus. They'd come, they'd come and they were trying to refute Paul, his teaching that salvation was by faith in Jesus Christ alone. So Paul was preaching that they didn't have to do anything except believe in Jesus Christ. The Judaizers, they said you also have to be circumcised and obey all the laws of Moses. So they were preaching, first you must become a Jew, and then you can become a Christian. And so the first two chapters, Paul defends his apostleship. In the second two chapters, which is what we've gone through the last couple weeks, chapters three and four, is he defended that truth, um, that truth, that justification was by faith. And in these last chapters, five and six, he deals with le living in the freedom that Jesus Christ gives. So he, Paul's now proceeding to show us how this great truth relates to life and action. So he begins by stating in verses, um, well, he begins by stating that this freedom we have in and through Jesus Christ, that is threatened by legalism. And so that's what he's saying in verses uh, 1 through 12, which is what we're going through today. Next week in verses 13 through 26, he teaches us that freedom does not mean we have a license to sin as some are saying he is teaching. And then in chapter six, he tells us that the freedom is perfected in our love for one another. And so he begins by saying, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery.
from the message. Christ has set us free to live a free life. So take your stand. Never again let anyone put a harness of slavery on you. I am emphatic about this. The moment any of any one of you submits to circumcision or any other rule-keeping system, at that moment, Christ's hard-won gift of freedom is squandered. I repeat my warning. The person who accepts the ways of circumcision trades all the advantages of the free life in Christ for the obligations of the slave life of the law. I suspect you would never intend this, but this is what happens. When you attempt to live by your own religious plans and projects, you are cut off from Christ. You fall out of grace. Meanwhile, we expectantly wait for a satisfying relationship with the Spirit. For in Christ, neither our most conscientious religion nor disregard of religion amounts to anything. What matters is something far more interior, faith expressed in love. You were running superbly. Who cut in on you, deflecting you from the true course of obedience? This detour doesn't come from the one who called you into the race in the first place. And please, don't toss this off as insignificant. It only takes a minute, of a minute amount of yeast, you know, to permeate an entire loaf of bread. Deep down, the master has given me confidence that you will not defect. But the one who is upsetting you, whoever he is, will bear the divine judgment. As for the rumor that I continue to preach the ways of circumcision, as I did in those pre-Damascus Road days, that is absurd. Why would I still be persecuted then? If I were preaching that old message, no one would be offended if I mentioned the cross now and then. It would be so watered down, it wouldn't matter one way or the other. Why don't these agitators, obsession, obsessive as they are about circumcision, go all the way and castrate themselves? Paul is writing that you've been set free through Jesus Christ. To stand firm in your freedom, to don't go back to prison again. Jesus said to the Jewish people of his day, so if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And Paul picks up on this and says, the Son has indeed set you free. Don't go back into slavery. So to those, to listen to those who are stressing that they must be circumcised and obey the Jewish law, Paul says it's to go back into slavery. Charles Erdman in his commentary on Galatians writes that ritualism is a form of heathenism. To attempt to save oneself by ceremonies is really a form of paganism. And so Paul is writing to warn them of this danger and then he condemns them, condemns the false teachers for teaching these things. Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by law have been alienated from Christ. You've fallen away from grace. So if you just disregard all that I've written and let yourself be circumcised, you're throwing away everything he has said, everything Paul said, in which they believed. He says you're abandoning your faith, that salvation is a free gift from God. It's not by works. And that you're accepting a belief that you can earn your salvation by works. He said in chapter 4, verse 9, How is it that you are turning back to those weak, miserable principles? He writes that if we're to try to save ourselves by works, we've fallen away from grace, that we've alienated ourselves from Christ, that we cannot get right with God through rituals or ceremonies, 
no matter how beautiful they are, it's only through faith in Jesus Christ. Not only that, Paul wrote earlier in Galatians 3.11, the righteous will live by faith. We live by faith, not by works. Not only are we saved by faith, we walk by faith. So what is the danger of rituals and ceremonies? Paul tells us that this danger is that we begin to rely on them rather than upon Jesus Christ. If we begin to believe that these things will impart to us the presence of Christ, then we've turned from Christ to them to give us life. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. We'll talk about the love part in a couple weeks. So stand firm in your faith. He writes, but by faith we eagerly await through the Spirit the righteousness for which we hope. Don't let anyone lead you astray. Paul wrote these words to Timothy, 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. What a statement. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Mm -hmm. He writes to these Galatians and says, you were running a good race. Who cut in on you and kept you from obeying the truth? He's saying, we, we were running this race together. I, I ran the race well. I finished. You were, but something happened. And so Paul wants them to answer the question. He spent four chapters. Of course, they weren't written as chapters in his letter. So however many pages this was that he spent four chapters worth, telling them God's plan of salvation, beginning with Abraham, all the way through to Jesus Christ. Um, so he says, uh, a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. I am confident in the Lord that you will take no other view the one who is throwing you into confusion will pay the penalty, whoever he may be. Verse 9 is literally, a little yeast goes through the whole lump of dough. And so this text is using yeast as a metaphor that its effects cannot be hidden when folded into the dough. And the yeast is the lie of legalism. I tried my hand at sourdough uh, at the beginning of quarantine. I failed. How do you fail at sourdough? It's supposed to be fail-proof. It, it wasn't. But I learned some things about yeast. There's just yeast in the air. And if you add enough sugar and flour, you have this right combination, which you can mess up. It does need to be, uh, there's a science to it. When you do it right, the stuff in the jar, the sugar and flour and water, it captures the yeast in the air. And in that little bit in the air that comes in, all these bubbles will form, and that's how you know it's healthy and alive. And then you can make bread from that. So you don't have to take yeast from a jar and to make bread. If you make bread, I don't, obviously. Um, but when I was reading this, it's a minute amount of yeast. It doesn't stay in just a section of the dough. It's through it all. Mm. 
Passion Translation. It says, let me be clear. The Anointed One has set us free, not partially, but completely and wonderfully free. We must always cherish this truth and stubbornly refuse to go back into the bondage of our past. I, Paul, tell you, if you think there is benefit in circumcision and Jewish regulations, then you're acting as though Jesus, the Anointed One, is not enough. I say it again emphatically. If you let yourselves be circumcised, you are obligated to fulfill every single one of the commandments and regulations of the law. If you want to be made holy by fulfilling the obligations of the law, you have to cut off more than your flesh. You have to cut yourselves off from the anointed one, and you've fallen away from the revelation of grace. But the Holy Spirit convinces us that we have received by faith the glorious righteousness of the Anointed One. When you're placed into the Anointed One and joined to Him, circumcision and religious obligations can benefit you nothing. All that matters now is living in the faith that is activated and brought to perfection by love. Before you were led astray, you were so faithful to Messiah. Why have you now turned away from what is right and true? Who has deceived you? The one who enfolded you into his grace is not behind this false teaching that you've embraced. Not at all. Don't you know that when you allow even a little lie into your heart, it can permeate your entire belief system? Deep in my heart, I have faith in the Lord Jesus, the Anointed One, who lives in you will bring you back around to the truth and I'm convinced that those who agitate you whoever they think they are will be brought under God's judgment dear friends why do you think the religious system persecutes me is it because I preach the message of being circumcised and keeping all the laws of Judaism not at all is there no longer any offense over the cross to tell you the truth, I'm so disgusted with all your agitators. I wish they would go even further and cut off their legalistic influence from your lives. So the Passion Translation doesn't use yeast as the metaphor. It says a little lie. And I like that. Um, I don't know why I can't find it. I'm going to try to read it again. Don't you know that when you allow even a little lie into your heart, it can permeate your entire belief system? Let's ask ourselves the question, who tries to separate us from the love of God? Who is the enemy of God who wants to destroy what God is doing in our lives? Father of lies. Father of lies. Mm -hmm. yeah. Paul wants them to see that these people who were trying to get them to turn back to legalism, they did not come from God. Now, you and I know that if it doesn't come from God, that it comes from Satan. And he writes something very harsh. It says in uh, the New International Version, verse 12, As for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. Now, I wasn't raised on a ranch. My dad was, my mom was. But we did have a small herd of cattle growing up in Star, and I know exactly what Paul is saying. And, and it didn't take me four or five translations of reading it to know what he's saying. <laughs> but we would take these little bull calves that we got from the dairy down the road, and it'd be a day's work. We'd take these cute little bull calves, and we would make them into cute little steer calves. 
And so Paul's writing, I wish they would make themselves into steers. He's confident that God will judge and punish those who are trying to lead them astray. He had great faith in God. And he had great confidence in them, the Galatians, the, the people of the church of Galatia, that they would recognize the false teaching and not allow themselves to become enslaved again. They were being stirred up. They were being fed little lies. And these little lies were permeating their belief system. Those little lies still exist today. There are still agitators today because Satan is hard at work in our lives. And how I see it most vividly right now is stirring discord and hate among friends, among family. Um, you know, social media is one example there's just a barrier between those words and the person on the other side that people feel free to share in ways that they would never share, hopefully, to your face. There, there's a barrier of protection for people to be mean because um, they don't know who they're being mean to. Mm -hmm. I've, I've talked with a gal this week who isn't sure this isn't for us, it's not our congregation. It's, she's just not sure it's safe for her to go and worship where she's been worshiping because she doesn't align politically with people she's worshiping with. And the only reason she knows this is because of the posts on Facebook. And they're not posts saying like, this is what I believe. It's saying, if you're this, then I, I wish you weren't here. Like, just, um, I don't like you. If you believe this, I don't like you. And and so suddenly it's a person. It's personal. Now the person posting, they don't know that someone else is taking this very personally and may not worship with them at church anymore. It's not because of the yeah. music. It's not because of the preaching. It's not because of the carpet. Other reasons why people leave. It's none of those. It's because she feels attacked. That because she doesn't align politically with some people she worships with, and they're so vocal, that now she's afraid to go and be herself. And this just popped off the page I me mean, this week. Those, that's agitation. That's stirring discord. That's stirring uh, conspiracy. Mm -hmm. That's stirring hate. And so the message for us from Galatians 5, 1 through 12 today, well, I believe we have the same message. Stand firm in the freedom that Christ gives us. Recognize false teaching. Do not allow ourselves to become enslaved again to whatever has enslaved us. And one day we will, re we will receive the crown of righteousness from our Lord. To whatever has enslaved us, and that's going to look different to each and every one of us. My friend, who I worked with this week, I believe she's enslaved to fear. Fear. Fear is very powerful. Fear is what's keeping me from interacting with you even with a mask on this morning. Fear is what's keeping her from feeling safe to go and worship. They don't talk politics at their congregation. But fear is what's keeping her from feeling like it's a safe place for her to go. So whatever has enslaved us, maybe it is addiction. Maybe it's lies, gossip, abuse. 
Do not allow ourselves to become enslaved again. One day, we will receive the crown of righteousness from our Lord. So stand firm in the freedom that you have in Christ, in Christ alone. Watch for false teaching. I have said many times, go home and reread the scripture. And if you find anything that I've said that contradicts what you believe the scripture is saying, come and let's talk. I do not want anything to be misunderstood. I do not want a false teaching. I do, I do not want to say anything that could lead someone astray. Are you hearing the feedback a little? Um, and so recognize false teaching. Look for it. That's what the Bereans did. They, they searched. They searched to see if what they said was true. Let's be like the Bereans. We have to know truth to recognize false teaching. So stay in the word, read the scripture, recognize false teaching, and do not allow ourselves to become enslaved to whatever we were slaves to before. Amen? Amen. Shall we pray? Lord, thank you so much for Paul's strong message this morning. Thank you that there's encouragement, there's challenging, uh, challenging words to make us really think about our lives, to think about the yeast in the dough, the small lie that can permeate our entire belief system. Lord, help us be messengers of love and truth. Help us recognize false teaching, to call false teaching out when we see it. Lord, we do not want to be the agitators of which Paul speaks. Help us to stir love into our conversation and grace and hope and to always point others to you. Let us live in the freedom that only comes from you, Jesus. In your name, amen. amen. Thank you, friends. Mm -hmm. Please rise.